Hello everyone, it is me, Smoogie. Welcome back to my Warhammer 40k video. And today we're going to talk about how do you write an ITC ready turn in list. Here we go. So here we go. What's the difference between ITC and like normal uh, games you play in the local game store? Now, first of all, the deployment method is the biggest uh, difference here. And then there's also a difference between how you score uh, based on the missions, right? So we have to talk about the deployment method first. Now, obviously, first of all, uh, the deployment method of ITC is a little bit different from what we have in 2018 chapter approved rule, whereas both sides deploy all their army at once in an ITC, they still, uh, part, of, part of their mission still use the uh, previous way of deploying which is both players deploy one unit at a time and then take turns and whoever finishes deploy first gets plus one in a roll off to determine who gets first you know like sort of like that it's the mission that have been playing since uh, 2017 but in 2018 everyone just deploy everything all at once which is much faster but also less uh, strategic and less tactical which is why in ITC they still use like uh, half of their missions still use the old deployment method, while the other half use the new way of deploying, which is the one we're familiar with right now. So that's pretty much it about deploying. Now you might ask, uh, what's the difference? Like, what's the big difference it makes? It actually makes quite a bit difference because um, in 2018, chapter approved that you don't have, you don't ever have to worry about unit count anymore because when you're writing a list, uh, whenever you get the chance to split your unit from one huge blob of swarm into two smaller squad of multiple small unit you would because not only uh, it would be much more flexible to move them across the map but also because uh, more unit on the table for you to maneuver and capture a point and then you suffer no repercussion because uh, having more drops than your opponent does no longer makes you go second in a way and also because the since the new way of deploying is that uh, whoever choose their uh, deployment zone goes go, goes second, but that's okay because you can always pick the side with the most cover. So there is also more advantage of going second. So in the new way of deploying, it's much easier that way. But in the old way of deploying, which is the 2017 way of deploying, which is still being played in the ITC, um, you might have to watch out for that. You know, you can you might have to watch out for the unit count because you don't want to have too much unit on the table that you're losing to your opponent on that plus one dice roll to see who goes first, right? So there it is. That's pretty much about the deployment. Now let's continue to talk about the missions. Um, there's two way, two major way to score in ITC missions. The first way is called the primary mission. The second way is the secondary mission. And obviously you can still score point by doing what the map tells you. In each mission, they will be specified on how you make point by camping this and this, or camping all four objective, or do something, you know, like that's more map specific, which I'm not gonna talk about today. But today I'm gonna talk about the primary missions. Now the primary version is pretty simple. There's two parts of it. The first part is you calculate the point you gain every uh, end of your turn and also uh, at, at the end of every battle round, right? So at the end of every of your turn, you check one of the two things. The first thing is, do you at least have one objective controlled? And the second thing is, have you killed at least one unit? Now, uh, notice the word here is called at least, all right? The hold at least one objective and kill at least one unit. So it doesn't matter how many units you kill or how many objectives you're currently holding, you're getting one point, one way or another, right? You're not getting multiple points because you're holding a lot of objective or killing a lot of unit. That comes later. There's more secondary missions specified for that. But as far as the primary mission goes, right, you only have to hold at least one objective and kill at least one unit to gain two points at the end of your turn. Now the second part of it is end of the battle round. So at the end of each battle round, whoever holds the more objective gets one point, and whoever kills more in that battle round gets uh, a point. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. There's nothing much different from it. Although I want to say though that holding at least one objective is pretty easy enough, right? Like you, you should at least have something to hold at least one objective. I mean, it's not really that hard. But here's the thing though, okay? As the game progress on, all right? As the game progress on, you and your, both you and your opponent are gonna have less and less thing on the table, right? Which also means that you'll, uh, it's going to be increasingly harder 
for you to hold something because you might lose everything at the end of term four or five. Now the second part, like the most fun part of ITC missions, in my own opinion, is the secondary missions. Now the secondary secondary missions are a bunch of smaller missions that a player gets to pick. They have they can pick whatever mission they want. Three of them, by the way. You each player gets to pick three secondary missions they wish to accomplish, and once they've done it, they both reveal it to、uh, the opponent simultaneously. By the time you're choosing your secondaries, you probably already see what your opponent has, like what his army,、uh, like what does his army look like, and what kind of unit composition he has. Like you probably have like a few glances of it. You probably can see what kind of Stuff he's running, and then you can start having some ideas, like what kind of secondary missions you want to choose, because secondary missions is all about picking the right one to fight against your opponent, picking the right one to accomplish in order to make the maximum amount of point. Right? ITC is heavily mission dependent. It's not about tabling. It's not about killing. Well, I mean, killing is a big part, but second, doing killing the right stuff. All right, killing the stuff that is. Hooked with the mission is going to be the most important part of winning in ITC events.、Uh, obviously, you can't just pick like、uh, three missions, right? Which is like、uh, basically just makes you rep repeatedly killing the same shit over and over again, and you can just rack up those points. You can't do that because whatever mission you pick, each mission only. Gains you four point, and that's it for the entire duration of the game. Not a battle round, not a turn. For the entire duration of the game you're playing right now, you only get ever going to get four point per mission. All right. So when you're picking your mission, you have to be very careful. You have to assess the situation whether it's possible for you to gain at least three points. Otherwise, you're wasting your mission slot, so to speak. I highly recommend you to just go to Frontline Gaming and just read the mission yourself because、uh, the stuff you see over here on the screen is the、uh, paraphrased version of what I wrote. Right? This is a paraphr. This is a paraphrased version. If you want like the actual word-to-word -word version, go Frontline Gaming. I'll put the description below. You guys can can go like check it out or something. Now, obviously, there's、uh, one last thing about the secondary missions. Now, the secondary mission does cannot、um, earn point concurrently. Basically, you have some missions that have very similar objectives, or the objectives sometimes overlap. When stuff like that happens, all right, if the if both of the mission does not have the little asterisk mark next to it, then the point cannot be scored concurrently. So that's a mark for death, right? Mark for death. Choose a enemy unit with seven power level or more, and if you kill it, you get one point, right? There's another one that's a let's say pick your poison, which is once you destroy one of the following keyword, you get one point. You cannot score both pick your poison and mark for death at the same time because they are not marked with asterisks. All right, so if you completed the objective, you have to choose which score you want to put that、uh, objective in. So that's you can only make one point for killing a single unit. That single unit that's. Uh, has a power level above seven, but at the same time has the keyword for pick your poison. Cannot net you two point in total. It only gains you one, and you get to pick which one you want to net the point with, and then the game goes on. Right. So that's pretty much it. So enough with how the secondary mission works. Uh, we're gonna talk about the, each of the missions and then how it will affect turnits, unit composition, and、uh, unit choices. All right, I think this is why you guys are here. All right, so let's get started. Now the first mission we have here is called the Headhunter. Now this is pretty straightforward. You gain one point for each enemy character you destroy, and like I said in the very beginning, you can only make up to four point per mission. So all you have to do is kill at least four character, and then you get the maximum amount of point, right? But here's the thing, though.、Um, the thing it will affect、uh, for Turnits in particular, we don't have a lot of easy, cheap character to get killed. You know, like our cheapest option are、uh, Turnit Prime, but we don't use Warrior that、uh, that much often. We usually just use Neurothrow, Flyrens, Oni, Swarm Lord, and sometimes maybe Brew Lord. Right? That's probably the unit we pick most of the time. We don't have like stuff like Company Commander. We don't have like. Very cheap, low health character that we need to worry about the headhunter. As a matter of fact, attorneys have one of the toughest HQ to 
uh, to survive on the battlefield. You know, like Flyer, it's very survivable, sweet plus, 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 plus. Even though, yes, it's a monster, it's like very big, it cannot hide behind the infantry, but that doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, 4 plus invulnerable save is gonna save you a lot of last cannon fire. So, as far as Headhunter goes, even though I stated it affects, uh, potentially affects Flyer and Swarm Lord because your opponent can gain point from this, but you can actually use this as your advantage. Say, if you're trying to lure your opponent from picking this secondary mission, it's like, hey, I got two Flyerans and a single Swarm Lord and nothing else. I don't have any other character on the field. It, that it, you know, Maybe I have a Neurothrope, maybe I have an one Knight, but those have a character special uh, keyword and they both have less than nine wounds, so it's much harder for you to kill. But I do have three very easy character to kill. So do you want to make this trade? Do you want to uh, choose the secondary mission? You can kind of lure your opponent from doing so, it's, by the way, it's almost always better force your opponent to pick the mission uh, that you want them to pick. Obviously, you can't force them, but you can present a list that trying to trick them into picking the mission that actually is disadvantage for them, not for you, right? So, for instance, if you have so many, if let's say you have like Flyers and Stormlord and everything, that like all the characters, they look very easy to kill, then your opponent may think, hmm, maybe I should pick Headhunter because there's like so many characters for me to kill, right? But as a matter of fact, once the game starts, what you can do is, is that, you know what? I'm going to deep strike both of my uh, uh, both of my Hive Tyrants, and he's gonna be like, what, wait, 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 you can't do that. I'm saying, yeah, of course I can, because I just hit my character uh, for a turn. That means, that also means that's one less turn for you to kill them, you know? Stuff like that, you can probably do some trick like those, you know, you can trick your opponent a little bit, but obviously this only works on an inexper inexperienced player, and as you play more, you can get a little bit more of a know-how on how to operate this in order to gain the most advantage for yourself. And the second one is the King Slayer. Now the King Slayer is very similar to Headhunter, except that you only pick one single enemy character model, and for every two wound you cast on that model, you gain one point. However, if the character you choose are vehicle or monster, then you only get a point for every four wounds you're causing, alright? And if the character you pick happens to be a warlord and you kill it, then you get another one point, alright? And the wound generated uh, from the character does not interfere with this, let's say I have like 12 wounds, right? And then you bring me down to like 3 wounds and I can somehow restore to like 6 wounds, that does not interfere with uh, how much wound I already cost on you. As a matter of fact, I can actually gain more point that way. Well, not above four, obviously. I can gain more than four, but I can potentially gain more point that way because it only counts towards how many, how much wounds I'm causing against that character. And that's it, right? I think this is designed to fight against Flyron because Flyron has like 12 wounds, all right? It has 12 wounds and for every four wounds, it costs you gain like one point, right? So if you kill a single Flyron, you'll gain at least three points. And if the Flyron happens to be your Warlord, then you get the four full point for the Kingslayer. So this might have to force you to not take the Warlord on your Flyrons as much as you want to. You know, um, Heightened Sense and Adaptive Biology are both pretty good um, Warlord trait on a Flying Hive of Tyrants, but because of the Kingslayer, you might have to think a bit, it's like, okay, maybe I don't want to give my opponent such an easy secondary mission, because if you cram everything together, even if you give it like a million mutation, even if you try to deep strike it, even if you try to like give it like, like I said, adaptive uh, biology and whatnot, all the defensive bullshit, right? If all your opponent has to do is focus fire and he gets like a very easy Kingslayer, you just get a Kingslayer, you'll get like four point, and it's all crammed into one single target. And when you're fighting in a 2K game, which, you know, ITC only play in 2K, by the way, it's much very easy for your opponent to just cram 2K with like Glass Cannon or Battle Cannon or even Volcano Lens on the single Hive Tyrant. And that Hive Tyrant is going to die, you know, like, period. It's going to die. You might want to uh, not put the Warlord on your Hive Tyrant, is what I'm saying. Right, you might, you probably don't want to do that. You just say, okay, you know what? You can get the three point from my uh, character, so be it. But you're not getting the fourth. You're not getting the fourth points because it only has 12 wounds, right? It only has 12 wounds and it does not have a warlord and you can only make up to three point from this particular model. And then you won't, you will never get the fourth because it says pick one enemy character, right? If it dies, it dies. Let's look at this next one. It's called the Mark for Death. Now, Mark for Death 
is pretty common. It's the one that I personally would pick if I play ITC Mission because just how easy it is, all right? It says choose four enemy unit with seven power level or more. And if you destroy the, these unit, for every unit you destroy, you gain one point for doing so. So you will be surprised how many stuff that actually has seven power level or more. You know, like uh, ever since the GW uh, introduced power level, like nobody gives a shit about it because like people think like point level is still like the most balanced way to play. But ITC um, actually use power level. And well, I mean not use power level for list writing, but use power level into case like this you know it's like you actually have to pay attention when you're writing in battle scribe to see what kind of unit that you don't want to go overboard and then give your opponent a free target to pick for mark for death which as you can see right here on the screen i have um, listed out the most common thing that's gonna go overboard right so here we go let's get started so for instance for the termagons right if you take less than 20 model 20 or less if you take like 1 to 20 models the power level of it's going to be 6 all right but as the moment you take the 21st model the power level is going to become 9 it's going to become power level of a 9 so if you're going to take like a blob of termagons don't go over 21 or if you want to go over then go all the way go all the way to 30 you either pick 20 or you pick 30 but never in between because if you do that you basically turn your termagon squad into a giant walking target that has a nine power level which is going to be the prime target for mark for death so just be aware of that and the same thing applies to hormigons it's also the same 21 plus model including 21 models will make the uh the hormigon squad from the power level of a six to power level of nine which is a prime target for mark for death as well same thing with gene stealers well i mean gene stealers you can't really help it because like we can't take like 12 gene stealers right even if we do it's still going to be above seven power level so it doesn't really matter in this case so I think it's probably just better if you take like the full 20 model per unit of a G Stiller, if the point allows you to do so, then just take the full 20 instead of like sticking with 16 because either way it's going to be power level 16 one way or another, which is above seven. So like just take the full 20 if you can, but if you can take the 16, that'll work too, all right? And obviously majority of our monsters, including x Crane, Terranifax, and also Hive Guards, they are all above power level 7. But there's one thing, one monster creature that does not go overboard. And that monster is Carnifax. Carnifax is pretty interesting because Carnifax has a power level of a 6, right? Doesn't matter how you equip it, I can equip it with like Venom Cannons and everything, it's still going to be power level of a 6. So if you take Carnifax, all right, which is pretty interesting that you can actually surprise your opponent. It's like, okay, I'm going to pick 4 units and he picks like Carnifax and you... And then you can tell him, like, uh, 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 no, because Carnifax is only power level of a six. It's not seven, right? So you, it's not qualified for the Mark for Death mission. And the next one we have is the Titan Slayer. Now this one, the original phrasing is very long, but since Terranus doesn't really have Titanic keyword unit, I mean we do, but like we don't use it because it's bad, <laughs> right? Um, so that's why we, I, that's why I kind of just want to omit this. But this is kind of like when we are hunting Imperial Knights. All right, if you're hunting Imperial Knights, we've been hunting Baneblade, which, you know, doesn't see a lot of play on meta anyway. But, yeah, if you see those stuff, you can pop Titan Slayer. For every 8 wounds you're causing on top of it, you gain 1 point. So, if your opponents bring a Knight, especially now the Imperial Knights, uh, Castle Knight, um, Invulnerable save went for a 3+, plus or 4+, plus, it's probably a little bit easier for you to cause 8 wounds, but I still probably wouldn't pick this as like my go-to secondary missions there, like there's other missions that's much easier to accomplish than trying to you know like rip off like uh, 32 wounds off one titanic unit you know like it's just much easier that way so like why pick titan slayer it's just no point doing that right not at all so don't pick titan slayer it's actually a waste of your secondary missions right it's just really bad so let's move on now let's check out the Game Busters. Now the Game Busters um, sort of affect Terranids and sort of doesn't affect Terranids. So basically what this is saying, okay, it's that if you're doing six damage, for every six damage you do uh, on a unit that has multiple models, which is one plus model by the way, it has multiple models and each model has more uh, more than uh, greater or equal to like uh, three wounds, then you get a single point. What kind of unit that falls into the category? Obviously, right? Warriors, Hive Guards, Venom Throws, and 
Bile Force. They all fall into this category. So for every six wounds you cast on them, all right, you gain one point. So I mean, usually we don't take Warrior. This is I think this is also the reason why Warrior spam isn't a thing because like they are the prime target for game busters like if you like spam a bunch of warriors like especially if you spend like three warriors with like two death spitter and the single venom cannon uh, your opponent can get like very super easy gimme uh game buster point by just killing your warriors like super easy they, every six wounds they cost all right average it doesn't even have to be like two separate warriors or like one single warrior it doesn't matter it says for every six wounds you cause on a unit that has uh, more than one model that has more than uh, more than or equal to three wounds then you gain a single point and obviously swarm is not affected so ripper swarm even though the ripper swarm falls under this description it does not be it cannot be qualified for game busters all right so ripper swarm yay that's also the reason why ripper swarms are so great as objective camper because they can't be targeted by game busters all right so that's pretty cool also like Venomthropes, like this is also a reason why people don't use Venomthrope like compared to Melanthrope. Like Melanthrope is probably better than, in, in that sense because Melanthrope not only it provides synapse, also because it's a character, less than 9 wounds, minus 1 to hit, yada yada, we all know that. Melanthrope is obviously like 100 times better than Venomthrope, but I think sometimes Venomthrope is still probably worthwhile just because like you know, for people who cannot afford Forge World or like you just don't want the model or maybe because you want to just bring like three venom throw and that'll be enough you don't have to spend like 140 points you just want to spend like 90 points for that minus one hit to hit bubble you can but if you do so then your opponent can probably gain some point of game buster but then again if you only ever have a single squad of venom throw all right then your opponent is not going to pick game buster anyway because there is no other alternative target for him to get all the four points he can only get like one point because you only have like one squad right but if you have one squad of venom throat and two squad of hive guards then game buster is going to start looking very delicious this is also a reason why i advocate to not take multiple hive guards because First of all, there's not gonna be that many terrain on the map for you to hide your hive guard with, and also because now there's more reason, you know, like people can just pick game busters and they can just like continuous continuously pound your hive guards and they can like get point out of it. So watch out for that. All right, hive guards is actually the prime target for this, especially there's so many stuff that can just ignore a lot of sight nowadays. So watch out for your hive guards with game busters. So remember when I said that um, uh, in the in the last few missions I talked about that. Um, Carnifax, it's a power level of a 6, so it cannot be qualified for Mark for Death, right? And uh, if, before you get too excited, I want to talk about this one. It's called uh, the Big Game Hunter. <laughs> As you can tell from the name, all right, um, uh, you get one point for every monster or vehicle that has seven or more wounds destroyed. Uh, okay, and this affects all our monsters. Like last time I checked, all of our monsters are uh qualify for this all right they have they all have more than seven wounds including carnivax uh, carnivax has eight wounds by the way so yeah like you just have to deal with this you just have to deal with this big game hunter if you bring like tons of carnivax let's say if you bring like mm, let's say if you only bring like two carnivax all right or three right um you either go big or you take none at all and this is how it works all right because like you you not not just you will have like carnifacts you'll probably have other monsters creatures too you're probably gonna have exocrine you're probably gonna have terrenofax uh they both fall in under this category as well and they're both relatively easy to kill okay they're both relatively easy to kill because they don't have minus one to hit well i mean i mean you can give them minus one to hit with melanthro but unlike carnifax we had which has forces he can provide his own minus one to hit uh exocrine and turn effects are the prime target for picking hunter as well right they can very easily get killed with this um secondary mission but for carnifax right carnifax let's say okay you know what there's one way to counter picking hunter it's that instead of taking like three or four carnifax you just take a tons of carnifax let's say you bring like five carnifax with like one or one nine right and just like charge forward now obviously your opponent will be uh, stupid to not pick Big Game Hunter because there's just so many Carnifax on the battlefield, right? But he can only ever make four points, right? He can only ever make four points, and Carnifax, once again, cannot be qualified for Mark for Death. So, 
once he finished big game hunter that's four point that's it you know the four point is made and that's it he cannot make more value out of killing your carnifex he can't do that anymore you know there is no other mission that will benefit uh, him for killing even more carnifex beyond the fourth one you know so i mean well obviously if he can because he has an entertaining weapon and there's nothing uh, better to shoot at then obviously he's going to shoot the carnifex but if you bring like five carnifex all right five carnifex or even six carnifex you bring like shit tons of carnifex then your opponent will be like, ah, shit, okay, I'll probably pick Big Game Hunter, but, like, you know, I can only ever make my four point out of it, and then that's it, right? And then you're running a very good strategy because, like, you spend more point on avoiding the secondaries to, by actually going into that secondary, by just, like, you know what, you want the secondary, I'll give it to you, right? I'll give it to you, and then go ahead and try to kill my card effects. They all have minus one to hit, and they're tough at seven, so, like, go right on hand, right? Go right on hand, kill my card effects, like, go right on hand, right? So... That's uh, one way to deal with Big King Hunter. And the second mission, another mission that we're gonna have is the Pick Your Poison. Now this mission looks a little bit weird. I mean, at least for fighting against Terranus, this is not like such a good mission to pick against us. Because it says, um, you choose four of the following, all right? Uh, Psyker, Flyer, Biker, Vehicle, Monster, or Titanic. Now obviously, like I said, we can just ignore Titanic because like we don't bring Lord of War nowadays so we can just like ignore the Titanic as Terranids. Uh, the, the keywords that we use very often are Psyker, Flyer, and Monster and that's it. We don't have Biker or Vehicle. I mean, I mean if you go Gene Steeler Cult maybe but like since we don't pick Gene Steeler Cult since we're talking about like pure Terranids then Psyker, Flyer, and Monster is the three common phrases uh, for us. Which again, once again, if your opponent pick uh, used to pick your poison then he can only have to make three points, right? And also, very importantly, this cannot be um, the same unit. Say, obviously, Psyker, Flyer, and Monster, who falls in, into this category? Flyer is. Flyer falls into this category perfectly, right? But you cannot choose a single Flyer to fulfill um, all three of the keywords. You have It has to be complete different target, which, once again, brings us back to um, this whole flyer spam because if you spend Hive Tyrants, right, let's say you take like two or three Hive Tyrants, then your opponent can go like, okay, you know what, I'm gonna go pick your poison, I'm gonna choose uh, Hive Tyrant A as the Psyker target, and then turn the, uh, Hive Tyrant B as the fly, and turn uh, Hive Tyrant C as the monster. Done. Like, I have my three of my pick your poison. I made three point out of four, I made my money back, and that'll be good enough, right? Your opponent can do that, and then you can try to avoid it by taking last Hive Tyrant, or you can say, fuck it, I'm just gonna take it, because, like, go ahead and try to kill my Hive Tyrants. They are very tough to kill, and this, once again, like I said earlier, you can try to lure your opponent from taking a certain secondaries, because there are so many secondaries that are so easy to accomplish, which I'm gonna get to later, especially the Asterix one. The Asterix one is really easy to accomplish, compared to all these killing monster secondary missions, right? So you can probably just pick a tons of, like, um, secondary mission that you're constantly luring your opponent and say, hey, you know what, maybe you want to pick the secondary mission. Like, you know, I mean, you can't exactly do that in the game, but by having all the carnifacts and like flyers on the table, you're um, subtly telling your opponent, say, you know what, maybe picking those missions not going to be that bad of a choice. And you know what, if he picks it and if he does it, then cool you know like cool by me because like he actually spent the firepower to kill my monster and not my objective camping unit which is the actual uh key to win the mission based game right so there's that next we have the butcher's will now you get one point for every two enemy unit you destroy in a turn and obviously once again you can only ever make four point out of this so you only have to kill two plus unit uh, for four turns like it doesn't have to be consecutive as long as you kill like up to eight unit over the course of the six turns of the game then you will get the butcher as well this is the bane of msu this is the bane of spore mine i see a lot of people talking about using spore mine as fast attack unit or using spore mine uh using barvor and the reason why barvor is kind of like falling behind a little bit is because like spore mine uh when you shoot the spore mine it will be treated as a single unit and then your opponent will probably pick the butcher's well because like 
all I have to do is kill the spore mine every turn, then I get uh, I get to fulfill the requirement for the butcher as well. And same thing applies to uh, the MSU. Um, the MSU, well, for turners, we don't have a lot of options for MSU besides a uh, turner warriors, right? Which is not very common in the manner right now, but I'm, I'm gonna talk about it later when I can. But right now we talk about, uh, right now we usually bring like a whole big swarm of like something, like a whole big swarm of gene stealers, a whole big swarm of like termagons, a whole big swarm of like, um, uh, 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 like uh, Hormigons and Termagons, like we bring all those stuff, we don't really have MSU as an option. So this is probably not that effective for us. Like the closest thing I can think of is probably the Ripper Swarm. But like then again, Ripper Swarm are very short. If you can hide it behind the terrain, it's actually quite hard to kill. I mean, they have nine wounds, you know, each base has like three wounds and you know, the minimum requirement for them is having three models per unit. So you have nine wounds in total. And if you are hiding them very well, if you're hiding them behind cover, it's actually quite hard to kill. It is quite hard to kill. And it's probably not enough for you to trigger, to, you know, force your opponent to trigger this because like, if all your stuff are really big, like big units, right? Big unit that's really hard to kill, then the butcher's world is not gonna be that of a good choice for your opponents anyway. But then again, just bear in mind that spore mine, all right? Before you're going for that, the whole spore mine strategy, just beware that your opponent can potentially pick the butcher's well and they can get like easy, um, they can easily fulfill the requirement for this particular secondary by just killing your spore mine. That's all you need to do, right? So just watch out for that. Next, we have the Reaper. Now, this is the first asterisk secondary mission that we see. Now, what? once again, let me just tell you what this uh, asterisk means, right? It means it can score concurrently with other secondaries that does not have asterisks, right? Or the secondary mission that does have asterisk doesn't really matter. It can just score simultaneously, right? So, for instance, let's look at the, the Reaper, right? It says you gain one point for every 20 models killed, but does not stack with Mark of Death, all right? So, what does this mean, okay? So, in the Reaper, right you can probably pick the reaper and the butcher as well you can pick both of them at the same time and for every 20 model you kill you get one point and if uh do with that 20 model if you happen to kill two plus unit with it you get one point for butcher as well as well remember i said at the very beginning that the uh, secondaries cannot be scored concurrently but if it does have an asterisk then it can it can be scored concurrently so the uh, the Reaper is the one that's designed to fight against Swarm Army, which is us, the Terminus, right? Because we have cheap, uh, mass, mass cheap models like Termagons, Hormagons, and, uh, well, I mean, Gene Stills are not exactly cheap, but we swarm them anyway, so they all fall under this category. So, this is also reason why the Swarm Army worked really well in just pure Chapter Approved 2018 rule, because you can just, like, flood the board, and then just camp the point, and then wait for the game to be over, right? You can just do that. But you can't exactly do it in ITC because if you do that, then your opponent can easily trigger um, the Reaper, right? Uh, once again, of course, the Reaper, you can only make up to four maximum point too, but in conjunction with other secondaries such as the Butcher's Well, or even in cases like Game Busters, they can just pick all those missions and they can all stack on top of each other. It's going to be pretty hard for you to we uh, weather against that. So just, this is also a reason why we don't see a lot of crazy these well, like crazy list uh, in, on ITC. It's also, it's just because like, there's so many missions that is tied to um, not making, encouraging player to take like the weird list. Like, ITC really encouraged players to take like the balanced list. So this is the, not a reason why you don't see like the full out Swarm Terran army on the table, even though in theory, all right, in theory, Swarm army is the best solution for us because in the current meta, there's just simply not enough anti-infantry weapon that can just kill us all. There's just simply not enough, all right? Um, and also because with the sudden death rule in uh, chapter approved 2018, even if I lose everything, I still don't lose the game as long as I camp the objective and I win by victory point. Then I can still win even if you wipe everything out of the table, right? All I have to do is throw my bodies at you and I win. 
right? But that wouldn't work in ITC because there's a stuff like Reaper in effect. So just watch out for that. So once again, the unit uh, target effect is the Termagons, Hormagons, Gene Stealers, and also bear in mind, Spore Mines, right? Spore Mines can be count towards the 20 models. Now, the 20 model does not have to be from the same unit. It can be from the different unit. It just, it's cumulative, right? It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what model I'm killing, right? As long as it's not model qualified for Mark for Death, then it all count towards to the Reaper, right? And then this is going to be another one of those like easy four point your opponent can gain if he if he's playing against a swarm army. So just watch out for this, all right? Next we have the recon. Now finally, less killing and more mission doing, right? So you get one point per turn for having at least one unit in each quarter of a table. Now I'm not quite sure what the quarter means, but I'm assuming that you just divide a map by four part. And then if you have at least one unit in each of the quarters, so basically you have to spread out your unit a little bit. If you spread out your unit um, across the four quarters of the table, then you gain one point per round, right? This is called a recon. I, I don't know if this is going to be like one of those easy gimmick missions because like, I mean, it does have asterisks, so you can actually score this in concurrently with uh, maybe behind enemy lines or like ground control. You can probably do that, right? But like recon, I think, well, I mean, Obviously, okay, so for the, like, it depends on how you deploy, right? Depends on how you deploy, but because, like, if you deploy, let's say, Dawn of War type of deployment, then obviously on the two side of your quarter, like, you know, both you and your opponent holds two part of the quarter, right? So obviously you can have one over here, one over here, and then you just have to send, like, two units into your opponent's quarter. And then it doesn't even have to be on, the like, the very edge of the table. It just have to be, you know, within that quarter, which is the, the midfield, sort of speak, right? It just have to be the midfield, but slowly drift towards to either side of the field, then it will count as um, they are all within uh, the quarter, right? So I think recon is one of those easy point. If you are playing an army that just spread your unit out a lot, then you can probably get this point relatively easily. But then again, like I said at the very beginning, this might look very easy at the very beginning, but like the first, first first two or three turns it's gonna look very easy because you have everything available to you but after maybe like turn three at the end of turn three most of the stuff just dies and then you don't have a lot of models to maneuver then this mission might start becoming a dead weight it might you know it, it can possibly be a dead weight so it depends now next one we have the behind enemy line so you get one point for having at least one unit in your opponent's deployment zone at the start of your turn so not only you have to deep strike well i mean deep strike is the fastest way to do so or you can just fly all the way there with gargoyle if you want to all you have to do is send something to your opponent's deploy opponent's deployment zone and survive all the way to your turn then you gain one point right so, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. What unit can actually do this very easily? I think Lictor can do this relatively easily. All right, Lictors can do this. But bear in mind, you, if you want to do this, you have to score at least three points. Otherwise, you're wasting this secondary. If you cannot score at least three points, you're wasting it. I mean, obviously, you can score up to four if you're really that good. But usually, we say if you can score three, that's good enough. You know, but if you can only score two, maybe you want to pick a better secondary. If you, if you can only score one, then you might as well not pick that secondary what at all, right? So you have to at least have the confidence or have the plan to allow you to score at least three points um, by picking this mission. So I'm thinking about uh, I don't know I don't know too much too much about behind enemy lines because if we're talking about stuff like lictors or whatever that deep strike, it only happens after turn two, and then. If you want to make four points, then they will have to survive turn two, three, four, and five, which can be hard. Which you know, you it can be hard. But then again, it does not have to be the same unit. As long as you have something in your opponent's deployment zone and survive all the way to your start of your turn, then you know, then you get the point. So I mean, you just have to take in consideration that whether this is a good deal or not. And then we finally have the ground control one. Now, finally, we still have a lot more to talk about. We have ground control. Ground control is not a gimme uh, secondary. It's pretty easy because it says uh, you get one point for each objective held at the end of last battle round. At the last of battle round. So if uh, if you hold one objective uh, in the previous battle round, all right, and now it's your turn and you gain one point for holding one objective but if you hold two objectives then you get two points uh for holding two objective 
uh, with your last battle round. So like the more point you're holding, the faster you can complete this mission. And then you can just get it out of your mind and just like make the four point and go home, right? <laughs> you can just do that. So uh, ground control is probably the most beneficial for us because like we can easily just spread out and control as many points as many points as possible and then just wider the first two turns and make our four point and then just go and we can just leave right we don't have to make more point for ground control anymore i mean obviously if you can camp the objective and continues to make point every turn because don't forget the primary mission still rewards you point for having more objective than your opponent does and having objective at least one objective held at the end of your turn so you still want that but it's not as pressing you know it's not as pressing once you make the four point from the ground control and then we have another weird one this is called the king of the hill so you get one point for having two non-character multi-model unit hold wholly within six inches of the center of the battlefield and then at the end of the battle round this cannot stack with recon crown control or engineer um, it has to be a unit that has more than one single model, all right. And also, non-character means like uh, Neurothrope is out of this as well. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then they have to be wholly within six inches of the center of the table, which I don't know why would you do that because like usually center of the table is the kill zone, like the part of the map that has the least amount of cover. So I'm not quite sure if this is like going to be like the best deal here because not only you have to sent um two non-character uh units there you also have to sit in within six wholly within six inches of the center and it cannot be characters all right so it can't be shot at normally then also it cannot okay it cannot stack with other stuff like recon ground control and engineer which is like okay you know what i don't know why anyone will ever pick the secondary but i guess to each of their own but like i don't see this is a good secondary for both you or your opponent so there's nothing too much to talk about this one and then we have the engineer now the engineer is quite interesting because like this is probably like the prime job for the ripper swarm so hear me out all right so for the uh, for the engineer select two non-character all right so neuro throw uh fly runs your guys are out of the equation and once again or fortification so uh you cannot use uh sports for this if they didn't attack cast like an ability and if they're controlling currently controlling an objective then you get one point all right so watch uh, be very careful of the word uh, the wording here it says and if either one of them so it's not like they both have to be within three inch of the objective marker it only has to be one of them else at least if at least one of them is controlling objective marker uh, and they're not attacking they're not casting any second power then you get one point for doing so now first of all this might look really weird but like because like why the hell would you forfeit the ability to attack or to cast second ability right and also it has to be non-character so it can't be just like a boring neural throw that's sitting in the back has nothing to cast like you can't smite anyone because everyone's so far out and um the hive guard next to him doesn't really need catalyst anytime soon so you can't just like sit there doing nothing right but you can't use um neural throw for this anyway because it has none character and neural throw is a character so now ripper swarm obviously because they can deep strike next to next to an objective i'll bet if there's like no one around because if so then they have to deep strike nine inches away but if they just deep strike next to an objective it's not like they can shoot anyway and like their melee attack are so freaking weak so why not just make them the engineer and just get some extra point while they're on the objective like why the heck not right like and it, you just have to at least one of them are doing it you can get like one point so starting from turn two or even turn one you can just like deploy your uh ripper swarm next to your objective and then let them be the engineer and they can start taking extra point every single turn because you know they're not doing anything anyway so might as well give them a job to do such as engineer the same thing can apply to termagons like uh, you know those backfield termagons that's not really doing anything because their guns are too short that's like 12 inch gun like what are you gonna shoot at right there's nothing to shoot at you can probably use termagon for this job as well if you really want to or you can pick like ripper swarm and termagons and depends on the situation if you really have to shoot with termagons then you can still shoot and let the ripper swarm to be the engineer this turn or you can just you know like 
or you can just like park both of them in two sides of the map if one get destroyed then at least the other one still survive and can continuously to make point for engineer and once again you only have to do this for four turns and after four turns you make your four point you don't have to do this anymore because the mission is completed you cannot make any point more out of this okay and venom throw is not a good candidate like i know venom throw has the way to attack it has like a shooty assault attack but majority of the time they don't really need to attack so they and they just provide like the aura so they can sort of fulfill this job as well but i probably wouldn't because like venom throw usually has to follow like whatever they're trying to provide a minus one to hit buff with or they have to hide all the way behind so they don't get shot at by stuff such as plasma or auto cannon or last cannon right they don't want to get shot at they want to sit all the way in the back or behind the building behind the cover behind whatever so it's going to be very rare for them to be sitting next to objective and yeah, it's just very rare, but it is still a possibility. You know, if the situation arises, you can nominate Venom Soap as your engineer as well. So finally, last but not least, we have the old school, which once again, okay, it's uh, the one that you guys are very familiar with. It's the, you know, the first strike, Slay the Warlords, Line Breaker, and then ITC add another one. It's called the last strike. So if you kill an enemy unit at the very last battle round, which is turn six, by the way, because the game just automatically terminate at turn 6 in ITC rules. If you kill something, then you get the fourth point. I think old school is okay. Like, if there's really literally nothing good for you to pick, you can probably pick old school because uh, first strike, uh, slay the warlord. Well, I mean, probably not slay the warlord, but first strike and line breaker are both very easy to accomplish, right? And if your opponent's warlord are really weak, let's say he picked like company commander as his warlord, then you can probably pick the slay the warlord as well, right? And once again, since this thing has asterisk next to it, you can score this concurrently with Kingslayer or with uh, the headhunter. You know, you can do, you can do it simultaneously you can score both at the same time for Terranids this is not really against Terranids in any way this is just like a general um general mission that anyone can do there's nothing much to talk about as far as Terranid goes so that's pretty much it and yeah thank you guys for watching this is pretty much my very first basic overview of all the secondary mission and the primary mission of the itc this is the first part of the video and the second part i'm going to i'm going to talk about how does all of these all of these secondary missions going to affect how we write a turn the list and in this in the next video i'm going to actually present a couple of lists that i write um and then just to tell you and explain uh, my mindset of okay so what i do with writing this list and what kind of secondary secondary missions i'm trying to avoid my opponent from getting and what kind of secondary mission i'm trying to do yada yada right all those kind of like all the juicy stuff i'm gonna put it in the next video but in this video i hope i just you know i really hope you guys learned something out of this because i do i actually learned quite a lot i actually learned a lot by doing this video so thank you guys for watching and i'll see you guys next week goodbye